situation, uh, which I believe he is on. Um, it's a deck that almost all of the Roanoke team has been playing, uh, with the exception of Jerry Thompson, who's on his own iconic Shardless Bug. We have an opening play for Jerry of a Deathrite Shaman. As I said last round, very ubiquitous as of late. Deathrite Shaman just seeing tons of play in Legacy. So, yeah, and as you said, a ton of play, both players with their Deathrite Shamans, actually causes for a bunch of interesting interactions, uh, as in the players may start trying to deny each other on the Deathrite Shamans by targeting when the other person targets. Uh, it looks like we won't see that happen, though, as Jerry, recognizing just how important a Deathrite Shaman is, he's willing to go ahead and pitch a Jace the Mind Sculptor just to force a will the Deathrite. So if you're looking at the... Uh for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Adrian Summer with Matthias Hunt. If you're looking at the screen and you're not a huge hardcore player of Legacy, you might be wondering what Deathblade is. Deathblade is the Stoneforge Mystic Dark Confidant deck that is also named by Deathrite Shaman. So basically lots and lots of really good creatures, control cards like Jace, like Source to Plowshares, and then some nice hand disruption. Shardless Bug, on the other hand, is the Shardless Agent deck that basically runs Cascade spells to get those Ancestral Visions out for free and a bunch of just very useful discard and uh, kind of card advantages over your opponents. Right, so Jerry's really playing that card advantage game that you were talking about here. After starting the Deathrite Shaman, he actually only kept a one land hand, but he double suspended, he spent two Ancestral Visions, which basically means in three turns he's gonna be getting a full six cards uh, which gives him rain to pretty much empty his hand right now, knowing that he'll get an entire new hand in a couple of turns. Now look how quickly Chris Van Meter is playing this. He drops a Liliana into play, announces verbally that he's going to be sacrificing one of Jerry's creatures, or forcing Jerry to sacrifice a creature, and still hasn't even tapped, and Jerry finishes his turn. This is awesomely fast play. They're two minutes into the game, and they're already several turns in. Compare this to the play that we saw with Dave Shields, who's playing actually in the background behind Jerry Thompson, a wow. much slower uh, set of plays. Jerry here tosses away a Shardless Agent to a Force of Will to stop Jace the Mind Sculptor. And a big misstep there, I think, from Chris Van Meter. He opted to cast the Jace before activating Liliana. Jerry's hand was Shardless Agent, Force of Will. He was able to Force of Will that Jace the Mind Sculptor, and now that plus from Liliana had no discard from Jerry. We saw speed here from Chris Van Meter, maybe showing why a, a little bit more deliberation can matter. Right, so now he's, he, uh, without that Trump and Jace, he's gonna have to find a way to deal with six six extra cards that are about to come Jerry's way. He does have a Stoneforge Mystic, but that's gonna be, Stoneforge Mystic is going to have to work very hard here. Yeah, one of the reasons Chris might be playing so quickly is, oh, that's a Dark Confidant and a Stoneforge Mystic. One of the reasons he might be playing so quickly, we saw uh, Dave Shields. <coughs> We saw Dave Shields nearly go to time in one round and go to time in another round with this deck. And it's just one of those decks that can take a while, and Jerry's deck can take a while. Both of these players know that the game can go long, and Chris was, I think, just hoping to make sure that if he went to a game three that he could win it. Yeah. Uh, Jerry joking that Chris should really plus the Liliana after finding these, his equipment. Um, but now Jerry, so a full hand of seven. Behind on the board, he's, he's down a Dark Confidant, a Stoneforge Mystic, and a Planeswalker. With a full grip, we're gonna see just whether or not he can deal with all these threats. One of the things that is holding Jerry back is his mana disadvantage. He is way behind on board development, but he practically cast a contract from below last turn, drawing six cards and then drawing one for his turn. That's seven cards he didn't have a moment ago. Right, so he probably gets him out of his mana fix. Um, and we're gonna see what, let's see, Jerry's gonna start with the Thought Seize. And goodbye equipment, that's a Batter Skull gone to the yard. All right, so one of the four, so the four cards you had to answer were the Batter Skull, the Stoneforge Mystic, the Dark Confront, and the Liliana, uh, answers two of them immediately, and suspends yet another Ancestral Vision. Now Stoneforge Mystic does not look very exciting if you don't have any equipment. You and see. he drew a, repla immediately drew a replacement Dark Confront. This is the new art Doc, Dark Confidant. If you're not used to seeing it, it's because Modern Masters has new art. Ancestral Visions number three ticks down. Jace the Mind Sculptor, better than all, bounces the bob. All right, so we're gonna see, Jerry actually drew a him to Turok there. A card is uh, pretty weak in this situation. He may try to, he's gonna try to get some value out of it. If he can keep the Jace on the board, he can unsummon with Jace and then hope to make Jerry discard cards. 
Why and not? that actually is not going to happen because Chris draws a him to Torak and then empties Jerry's hand, drops the Dark Confidant back down. So Jerry, despite having drawn seven cards, now is the one out of cards. He was not able to make a big enough dent in Chris Van Meter's board, even having seven cards. Jace, the Mind Sculptor, activates the Brainstorm ability. That's draw three cards, put two back. We see a Force of Will, we see another Ancestral uh, Visions, and we see Deathrite Shaman Tarmogoyf. All right, and both of which join the table. Yeah, speaking of those cards, yeah, that's exactly what he's going to go with. So that's that fourth Ancestral Visions that Ooh. he has there. Okay, this might be the first time I've seen this. Yeah, I think see. we're going to have Dueling Jaces. Right, so remember, the new Legend Rule Jaces are no longer removal spells for other Jaces. You can do both. Uh, we will pro may only briefly see Dueling Jaces, as Chris Van Meter will, pro will almost certainly use his Liliana to push through some damage and take out Jerry Thompson's Jace the Mind Sculptor. But yeah, um, he may be yeah, debating the difference between... He has a couple lines. He can use Liliana to Edict. He can use Jace to Unsummon Liliana to Discard, which is probably a little... Which that way gives him the option of picking which one dies. What about this? Jace, Bounce, Deathrite Shaman, then Liliana, Edict, the Tarmogoyf, Attack the Jace. Right. Well, no matter what, I think this, turn, this play is going to end in Attack the Jace. Uh, it's very unlikely that Jerry will get to keep his Jace this turn, but what Chris decides to do with it... How Chris decides to do it is what he's taking on right now. Boom. 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 So Jerry goes. Thompson drew seven cards in that turn a few turns ago. Now nearly empty. Suspends a new Ancestral Vision. Lays a Death Rat Shaman empty-handed. But he will have four cards next turn. Right, so it's going to be really... Well, the question is, how many cards does Jerry need to equalize on this board? The thing is, is that even though Chris is running out of cards, he has so many virtual cards here. Every time he activates a Planeswalker, it's like drawing another card. Dark Confront's actually drawing him more cards. Uh, in a certain sense, he's keeping up every bit with Jerry's card advantage. One of the things I could imagine happening is a uh, he's going to do the Brainstorm, but I could imagine him bouncing with Jace, the Deathrite Shaman, and then using the plus one on the Lily to empty out... Um, the, uh, the cards, but he goes for the Brainstorm instead. His yeah, we, hand is so, so full of stuff that basically does not interact with the board. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, with it, from Esper Stoneblade, it's hard to find much more of a board that Chris could have here. You know, he has both his Planeswalkers, he has two of his best creatures. Um, I think he's probably one Deathrite Shaman sh short of really having all the threats in his deck assembled. Well, a one equipment would be nice. Right. With the Batter Skulls in the Graveyards, he does still have an Umazawa's Jite left. Uh, if he gets time, he could, he, and can't find another Stoneforge Mystic, he can always unsummon his own Mystic to go get the Jite if he needs to. Three land, a Thought Seize, and a Him to Turok in hand. Yeah. Well, he's probably going to get rid of the Thought Seize. Two go Jer back. He have to imagine that cards will not stay in Jerry's hand very long. Uh, he, we may keep the Him because Him's still a two for one. Jerry is going to fill up in a moment. Yeah, and Chris is actually willing to let that Liliana go. Um, because I think he, he's viewing right now, he could have used Jace to unsummon and Liliana to discard it that way. I think he views the additional Brainstorm as Jace as more important than having the Liliana on the battlefield at this point. Three cards, one card, up to four. She has another Deathrite Shaman, a Force of Will. Force of Will a little late right now. A Polluted Delta and a Baleful Strix. Baleful Strix, blue-black for a 1-1 flying Death Touch bird. Draw a card when it comes into play. Yeah, it looks like Bear Jerry's going to match his Baleful Strix with another Baleful Strix. Gives him a pretty good board presence, but there's this problem, you know, Jace, Chris has used his Jace at least three times here. Um, it's really hard, it's really hard for Jerry to keep pace with this card advantage. Jerry has drawn so many cards, but it's trying to muster some sort of defense. Yeah, but I'm not even sure he's drawn as many cards. I mean, probably he's physically drawn as many cards, but, you know, it, it's close. Who is that? Van Meter is, is drawing, you know, right now he's drawing three cards a turn and getting to pick which cards they are. And Dark Confidant once again triggers zero. And as he, as we knew beforehand, it was a fetch land there. Uh, seems that Chris does want that additional card. He could have cracked a fetch land to get a new top of the deck there, but he's going to redraw that Thought Seize. And we may see an emptying of Jerry's hand now from Chris Van Meter. Just one, so you can pretty much tie up all the loose ends here. 
one of the opening plays I expect will be either a brainstorm effect from Jace the Mind Sculptor, which is what's happening. And I think he'll probably follow up with a hymn to Turok. So many lands in hand. Puts two back, leaves himself with one fetch land in hand. I predict before the beginning of his next draw step, he will use that um, fetch land in play to shuffle away those other lands. Well, yeah, and it's a pretty common move there with Brainstorm. You know, it, it doesn't just get you oh. one card, it gets you more than one card. He has another Stoneforge Mystic in hand. He does not even need to sacrifice his land to do that play. Right. Yeah, and you know, once again, showcasing the power of Brainstorm, it, it draws more than one card when you want it to. Um, the, because of the, its ability to let you replace cards with different cards, it often is drawing two or even three cards, or it feels like it's drawing two or three. Online from Twitter, I like at Hurricane's Hand says, wow, what would a Blood Moon do here? <laughs> it would make both of these players, if a third player suddenly stepped up and put down a Blood Moon, it would make both of these players pretty sad. Well, Blood Moon's a, uh, we see a lot of Blood Moon against Shardless Bug, actually. Shardless Bug is a deck with no basics. It's very vulnerable to Blood Moon. Uh, as for Deathblade, I do believe plays, well, actually, no, it also does not play any basics. Yeah. So yeah, both decks are very soft to Blood Moon. We see a, a Brainstorm the Spell Brainstorm cast by Chris Van Meter. Yet more lands and thought seizes. Yeah, well, I mean, he's really just a stat, trying to prepare for any contingency of what Jerry could have or what Jerry could draw. He is, like I said, like you said before, he has all his most powerful cards in play. So when you have another Stoneforge Mystic in your hand, even, like, the question kind of begs the question, what are you even looking for at this point? You know, the answer, just be more one-for-ones, just some insurance, I, guess, I suppose. Two cards go back. right now, yeah, he does have the lands, he has the Hymn to Turok, he has a sword, no, sorry, a Stoneforge Mystic, he does not have a sword yet. Death Touch, such a nice ability. Right, yeah, the Baleful Strixes are actually doing a good amount of work here, they're threatening the Jace and keeping Chris's attacks out. Uh, but that's it, so Chris, instead of going to work on Jerry's board, is going to work on Jerry's hand. And Jerry loses Force of Will and a land. I, I think tell it was a fetch land. Yeah, I think it's a Verdant Catacombs. Left with one card in hand. And one of the ways that Chris can get advantage would be if he can get that equipment to find Stoneforge Mystic. That is a way he can gain an advantage. Uh, interestingly, he his Jace currently is threatened here from the Baleful Strixes. Thoughtseize from Chris Van Meter. And that'll get the death right shown. It, it's, it's, yeah, we'll see a swing from Chris. The fact that Jerry's at six, uh, Chris wants to put in enough pressure here that Jerry actually can't afford to attack the Jace with the Baleful Strixes. If he can pull that off, then Jay, he'll get to keep his Jace, which should be enough for a victory. And Jerry contemplating how he wants to block on the attack. Going to three is certainly a dangerous place to be. It means the next attack is lethal. However, if he doesn't block with the Strixes, if he blocks all the Strix, he can save himself an extra turn, but that means he can't kill the Jace. He's in a little bit of a dilemma. And part of the problem, too, is there's still mana open. He does not know that, for example, if he does go for the kill the Jace plan, that it's possible that Chris might just have a removal spell. Right. He goes for a halfway effect, blocks the Dark Confidant, takes one. Chris replaces it. So now, without a lethal attack on Jace, Jerry's gonna have to, he has one draw, and still, it's funny, so uh, this board of Planeswalker, Dark Confidant, Lil, Dark Confidant, Stoneforge Mystic, is the exact same board that Chris had when Jerry got to draw six cards off those first two Ancestral Visions, and it's like three Ancestral Visions later, Jerry hasn't made a dent into that board. In fact, Chris has just replaced the Liliana with a Jace. He's actually made his board better through all nine of those extra cards. Dark Confidant says Creeping Tarpit, yeah, and Jerry seems a little resigned right now. Uh, that are... particular kind of shrug that only Jerry seems to be yeah, able to do. Yeah, you know, do. and I know, yeah, Jerry, unlike, interesting, unlike Brad Nelson, Jerry's the kind of person who will always make his opponent play out the entire game. Um, we saw last time, you know, this probably is, may, may be the kind of situation where a lot of, where it's, if you think a time's an issue, you may move to another game. Um, but especially, especially when you're a deck like Jerry's that has a lot of, 
good card advantage. It's probably always correct to keep going on in a game. Well, another thing to think about, too, is early in this game, Chris Van Meter made what might be arguably a mistake based on playing very quickly. This exactly. match can go very long, and Jerry does not mind making Chris just finish things off. Jerry does not have to do anything like slow playing. He doesn't have to do anything sketchy. Yeah. What he can do is just make him finish it out. All right, and he sees the GTA, and that'll be enough for him. So first game does go to Chris Van Meter, as for Death Blade. And so for the second game, uh, there was some sideboarding. Uh, we were talking, I was talking a little bit in the last round about Jerry and this matchup. Um, one of the, what he, how he said he views this matchup is he said it's all about board presence. Um, I think that probably couldn't have been demonstrated more by this last game we just saw. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When we say board presence, you know, obviously what we mean is who has anything relevant on the table? Relevant cards are Jace the Mind Sculptor, any equipment, Tarmogoyf, Dark Confidant, Liliana of the Veil. Those are the primary relevant cards. A permanent. Yeah. The thing is, for Jerry's deck, Jerry has a ton of disruption. His hand didn't really play out that way, though. Normally, the way this deck plays, you get a Shardless Agent. The Shardless Agent has been set up to get you a card like Ancestral Vision, and you immediately get your reward. Instead, it came out kind of slowly, and that gave Chris Van Meter time to answer everything, drop his own Jace, and then take the game away with that Jace. All right. Yeah, and I, it really, um, so when I got him, he said he viewed it as a, as a big, as basically all about board control, and he said he sideboards accordingly. One of the cards he says that he brings out in this matchup that almost no other player does is he boards out him to Turox in this matchup, actually. Jerry boards out hims? Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, he says the card's good, but it doesn't affect the board, and we did kind of see that last game. You know, Jerry was behind on the board, and it didn't really matter how many card advantages, how many three-for-ones he played. He just couldn't get back in the game. That makes sense to me in certain ways, because... When the game can be about, can you answer a Jace? Let's pretend that they've had a Jace out for just two turns, and they've activated the zero ability to draw three and put two back to brainstorm twice. That's and then you draw the him to Turok, and you're like, aha, I got back a little bit of card advantage. And then you say, well, go. Yeah, the only hymns that were really good that game were the ones that Chris Van Meter played after he had the Jace in play. He was using them to two for one to lock up the game. But then the game's not about the him, it's about the Jace. Yeah. So looking at the cards in Jerry's board that he'll use then, I would imagine would be he has another Liliana of the Veil, and he has two disfigures, which actually seem to put him, I would think, help him establish control over the board. That's really, really interesting. I, I think that you have nailed something on the head there. Um, looking at these other cards, you know what? I actually think Thoughtseize is a very powerful card in this matchup. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I know Jerry was talking about uh, the board, but Thoughtseize comes in underneath a Dark Confidant and can stop a Dark Confidant from hitting the table. Um, yeah. A turn on Thoughtseize seems really relevant in affecting the board, so I don't imagine... Jerry has two main, two sideboard. I can't imagine he's taking out all his Thoughtseizes. That said, I don't know if he's going to go up to four, because I feel like it might be that after turn one, he doesn't particularly want the card. You know, he just wants that one Thoughtseize. Which, depending on, I guess, what his philosophy on that is, we may see... We'll see some number of them in. Um, that said, on Chris's side, he also can augment his board plan. Well, Chris, one of the things that he, uh, he has to be aware of is that Path to Exile is an answer to Tarmogoyf that is better, actually, than Soars to Pashers. There are usually zero, very rarely one, basic land in a Shardless Bug deck. So Path to Exile is just straight up an improvement of Soars to Pashers. Right, so... And because this game is about the board, if Chris views it that way, he'll probably board in this extra path to exile to, in addition to his other swords. Right. Of and he has a second Vindicate, one in the main, but a second Vindicate in the board. Remember, Vindicate can hit anything. So that includes a Jace the Mind Sculptor. Mm -hmm. We have a couple other options. He's playing two Meddling Mage and a Snapcaster Mage in his deck. He has a lot of uh, a lot of removal. It'll be interesting to see how which removal spells Chris thinks are relevant, and you know how many of them he wants to have. I also like the Snapcaster Mage in the board. And turn one, Deathrite Shaman. Brainstorm, end of turn. Yeah, possibly digging for a Force of Will here. Otherwise, you usually wouldn't end step Brainstorm. And I don't believe he hits it, so that's going to get to survive. We do see a lot of other goods in Jerry's hand, though. We see Maelstrom Pulse, we see Shardless Agent, we see a Jace the Mind Sculptor. 
Um, we see another brainstorm and it looks like a bevy of lands. So a little lacking on early game action, but he does have removal spells and card advantage right now. Baleful Strix. I mean, part of it, obviously the brainstorm there, a little less effective cast like it was in terms of improving the hand, but there's only so much time sometimes in the early game can't monkey around sometimes. Right, sometimes you just have to cycle the card because you need more, you need, you know, if Jerry's hand's really lacking in something, uh, like a turn two play, he just needs to play that right away even though it's for less than full value. We and see a fetch from Chris Van Meter. So two, this gives him access to three mana if you include the Deathrite Shaman. Right, so the three mana could be Liliana or it could be one of the deck's iconic two drops. And it looks like it's gonna be three. And Liliana eats the Baleful Strix. And such respect for Baleful Strix there that, you know, it gets a Liliana Edict. Uh, it draw, you know, draws a card and then and then gets the main activation of a Planeswalker. Uh, still pretty good here. And Jerry is not particularly um, unhappy with that trade of, in, a, in just the abstract sense, putting a creature into play, drawing a card, and then knocking out the first Edict that is possible from Chris Van Meter. Both those players are basically fairly happy with that. Okay, we're gonna have our first casting of Shardless Agent in this matchup. He had a decision here. He could either blindly Shardless Agent or he could Maelstrom Pulse, probably at the Death Rite Shaman. I think his biggest fear would be that Chris Van Chris resolves a Jace this next turn. Because uh, Jerry does not have a Force of Will. So he could Maelstrom Pulse to avoid that, but he think he's determined that that's too much of a cost. He's gonna go ahead and try to get it this way. Spin the wheel. Oh, and he gets to have Disfigure. his figure and eat it too. He gets he gets a 2-2 and he gets the Death Rite Shaman. So, Shardless Agent is the card which gives Shardless Bug its name, Shardless. Uh, it's a card from the Commander set, I believe. And just a 2-2 with Cascade. Probably most relevant about it is its mana cost and its colors. Looking at that artifact creature, it is a weird card. You can see a swords to... Was it a... a swords are a path. Lingering Souls, actually. A Lingering snow, Souls Snapcaster Mage in his hand. Another Deathrite Shaman. So the, yeah, a lot of creatures, which seems pretty good for Van Meter here. You know, just a lot of ways to interact with the board. He's going to continue to play Threats, and he has a lot of uh, Threats that really hit twice. Lingering Souls, Snapcaster Mage. Um, it's going to be on Jerry's deck, the deck with probably more card advantage, to see whether or not he can answer all of them. When they do a discard, Brainstorm and Snapcaster go away. Now, interestingly, he decided he decided to discard a Snapcaster Mage instead of discarding the Lingering Souls. He values those two one ones so much in this matchup. Jerry Thompson now having to make a decision, and it's Jace the Mind Sculptor bounces the Dark Confidant. Shard the Sagent comes in at Lily. And Lily dies. Yep, Chris had to pick between Deathrite Shaman and Liliana, and he chose to keep the Deathrite Shaman. Both players really here pushing back and forth for who can, basically who can control the board. If he's got a land in hand, and I think he does, he has access to up to five mana, and that five including the Deathrite Shaman, and that would allow him to play, for example, a Lingering Souls from hand and flashback, or a Lingering Souls and a um, Dark Confidant once again. Yeah, he's gonna have to commit hard right now to the board. Reason being is that Jerry does have a, Jerry has a Jace, and the Jace isn't gonna die this turn. Okay, and we see that he does not have the land, attacks Jace for one, dropping Jace down to one. Yeah, and what this is gonna mean is that Jerry can't unsummon with Jace this turn. Um, he's hoping to set up a board where these Lingering Souls tokens will take out the Jace. I think Chris probably feels that if he can take care of Jace, he'll be ahead here, but he has to do it relatively soon before Jace does something like find another Jace. Well, I mean, the total nightmare would be if Jerry used Jace to assemble Shardless Agent into Ancestral Vision. Exactly, that's, and both the fact that both Brainstorm and Jace can do that is pretty threatening. Um, because Jerry discard, discarded a Brainstorm, he probably doesn't have that in his hand at the moment. However, you see a Fate Seal effect. Yeah. That is the plus two from Jace. Look at the top card of a player's library and you may put it on the bottom if you choose. Yep, and he will do that to Chris Van Meter, looking at it and putting it on the bottom. Three mana. Maelstrom Pulse gets Deathrite Shaman. Yeah, uh, I think one of the ways that Jerry wants to improve his board state right now is what he, what it looks like he's trying to do is he's gonna go at Chris's mana. He sees that 
If Chris can only cast one spell per turn, Chris probably won't be able to keep pace with Jace. I mean, it's very hard to keep pace with Jace to begin with, but when you're choked out on mana, it's just practically impossible. Yeah, it's, what's really interesting is that Jerry chose to Maelstrom Pulse the Deathrite Shaman instead of he had the option to wait for Chris to flashback Lingering Souls and to Maelstrom Pulse the Spirit Tokens, which is one of his only ways to actually take care of all those creatures, but he he values the Deathrite Shaman and the mana so much in his game plan that he's going to go ahead and make that play instead. Uh, and as you see, like, this is certainly a strategy, and it's, it's probably it's pretty good here. Chris is really lacking on resources. And he comes after the Jace, trying to get that Jace off the table. So we see a Brainstorm, a Polluted Delta, a Dark Confidant, all from Van Meter. Remember, and also that Brainstorm Fetchland trick can't be used because Chris Van Meter has been wastelanded off all his blue sources currently. Let's so go back to Jerry Thompson. Jerry here, very commanding presence. Shardless Agent marches in once again. And then with Chris Van Meter not flashing back, the Lingering Souls, it does give Jerry the opportunity to eat it with his Deathrite Shaman in play. Yeah, so the reason Jerry, yeah, the thing is that Jerry kind of has a trick up his sleeve right now in that Golgari Charm. It takes care of the Lingering Souls token and it take care, takes care of the Dark Confidant. Um, it's a pretty big, I think it's fair to say it's a pretty big blowout right now. Jerry Thompson uses the uh, Fate Seal ability on himself. Uh, minus one, minus one to all creatures. Exactly. Boom. Die, die, die. I will lose nothing. Right, and now that, remember, that's... How about you lose two more life when I remove your lingering souls from the graveyard? Chris and left. now how are you doing? Chris left with just lands and no way to meaningfully interact with Jace. And Jace keep, as we saw last game on Van Meter's side, if the Jace doesn't get answered, the Jace will win the game. For those of you who are just joining us, I'm Adrian Sullivan here with Matthias Hunt. This is SCG Live, the StarCityGames.com open series featuring the Invitational here in New Jersey. On the left, Chris Van Meter with Deathblade. On the right, Jerry Thompson with Shardless Bug. Shardless Bug, the black-blue-green deck so named by its uh, Shardless Agent card, a card that is fairly new to uh, a lot of tournament play. I think it was last year at Origins that we first saw Shardless Bug. Origins, the, uh, the large gaming convention at the SCG there. I want to say that was uh, Joey Pasco and Cedric Phillips commentating at that event, really making its debut at that weekend. Yeah, and eventually, this, as we said, this Charlotte's Bug deck, piloted by Jerry, was the winner of the last Invitational. This is almost card for card the same deck. So Chris, having drawn for the turn, he does have a Brainstorm and a GTA, but he has no creatures to put it on. Uh, he's gotten far enough behind on the board that it's going to be really hard. So Sorry, he does have one creature, but... So he has a Dark Confidant. Still gonna be hard pressed here. Now he does not lay the uh, Umazawa's Jite. I believe primarily basing, basing this on the idea that maybe Jerry will not use the Jace to bounce the Dark Confidant. And then if so, he can drop the Jite into play, equip it, attack, and then with any luck, have an active Umazawa's Jite that can do something useful to the table. Yeah, there's not too much value lost in hiding the GTA here. We haven't seen any indication of thought seizes from Jerry either. In for a total of six here, knocking Chris Van Meter. Well, in for three, three. and attempts for six. Yeah, the Wasteland in play, left untapped, kills the Creeping Tarpet. And Jerry suspends an Ancestral Visions, just kind of letting Chris know that if Chris does deal with the Jace, he's going to have to deal with a lot more. Uh, didn't wait to try to cascade into it, he's perfectly fine, just kept, just suspending it. Untap. And what do we have? Anything to change the world? Dark Confidant once again. So recast the card Confidant, leaving up a potential source to Plowshares mana. Uh, he had that quick switch there at the end, which is either, sometimes can be a tell that, you know, it's actually not, that the uh, answer isn't there. Attack for two, leaves Deathrite Shaman up to do two damage. You gotta remember, Deathrite Shaman can actually do the remainder of Chris's life total all by itself, so Chris is going to have to find a removal spell for Deathrite Shaman relatively quickly, and rather than look for it, he's gonna go ahead and move to game three. I mean, he sees the writing on the wall. Jerry uh, now brings it to one and one, going to a game three. Chris Van Meter took game one, Jerry Thompson takes game two. And now they shuffle up, looking to see which one of these players 
is going to still be very much on track for a definitive top eight. Great. So uh, looking at game three, it seems like both players here really, I think they, they seem to be on the same level with the matchup based on how they've sideboarded. Uh, both players seem to cut all their discard and just went for really impactful spells. Lingering Souls and Snapcaster Mage both making an appearance from Chris Van Meter, which exactly. isn't to say they both are committing to the idea that the board is what matters. Right. Both these decks play a large discard suite, mainly so that they can compete with uh, with the combo decks of the format. But that's that said, um, because these aren't combo decks, you'll see a lot of that get boarded out. Even though the cards like him to throw out have the potential for a for a straight two for one, um, because things other than cards in hand matter, it just seems like that they they need to pay attention to other things. They don't really have time to make those kind of plays. One of the things about Legacy that I find uh, you know very interesting is that you end up having a collection of cards of various different ages all making appearances. There was a time when Termogoyf was new. Termogoyf has not been new since a very long time, about 10 years now. And then a card like Brainstorm's been old for a while. That first making an appearance, I want to say in Ice Age. So we've got cards that are like about 18 years old. We've got cards that are um, 10 years old. And then we have a card like Deathrite Shaman, which is only about a year old, not even a year old, I don't think. Yeah, so it's really this mismatch, mishmash of a bunch of cards from different eras all together. Um, usually, I'd say it, it's, a, it's a test to be playable, and I'd say it's a test in efficiency. You know, most of the legacy playables all cost one and two mana. Yeah, there are, there are these strange moments where you have a card that costs more. Chris Van Meter's sideboard, for example, includes one Supreme Verdict. But the Supreme Verdict, you would not probably have seen a Wrath of God in that slot. Supreme Ver Verdict does a lot of things in his sideboard, potentially even for this matchup, though I'm not sure that it would show up, where it's both a blue spell for the Force of Will that you might have. He has Force of Will in his sideboard. But also, the uncounterability means that when you're dealing with a deck that might put some pressure on the table and then use that moment of, uh, you know, fragility in your life total, just say, no, one counter spell, and now you're dead. Supreme Verdict says, no, you can't counter me, and so I'll wipe the board. Yeah, Wrath of God hasn't seen play in Legacy for a long time, mostly because it's just a little too expensive for what it does when the decks are this efficient. Uh, you do see Supreme Verdict see play a little bit. It's an odd that, well, Wrath of God is pretty inefficient, but if you're going to play one, if you're going to go that direction, then you definitely want it to resolve. Thank you to uh, Baron Sangir, who reminds me of my rounding error. I rounded six up to ten. Tarmogoyf, only six years old. Okay. Able to go to kindergarten, not looking to go to fourth or fifth grade. All right, so for our third game, we have Chris Van Meter on the play here, um, which is seems to be more relevant. Um, we may see a couple sideboard differences. It seems to be more relevant because Jerry has, as you were talking about cards like Thoughtseize, uh, on the draw, it might be that Jerry doesn't have time for that kind of card. He has, though, it looks like bordered in Nile, his Nile Spellbombs. Nile Spellbomb is an interesting card because he did see a Snapcaster Mage, right. so there is some value to actually using it. There are Deathrite Shamans in the mix here, so there's value in using it in that way as well. Right, and he has Lingering Souls, which obviously won't hit if uh, once the Nile spell bomb is in play, Chris can Chris can play around that by hanging on to priority. But that said, uh, five mana is a lot in Legacy. And one of the things that uh, Chris has in return a similar card, Relic of Progenitus, which actually has a lot of value because he's fighting against Tarmogoyf. Tarmogoyf, one of those cards that uh, really does not like Relic of Progenitus. Yeah, I mean. A lot of the graveyard, it's interesting because uh, Tarmogoyf actually has lost a little bit of value recently in Legacy because there's so much more graveyard hate now. That's mostly, some of thanks to Love of Progenitus, but really mostly thanks to Deathrite Shaman and cards like Rest in Peace. Uh, now that Tarmogoyf's not great, it's still a very good card, but it's not always the giant creature you want it to be. It's interesting because a lot of the decks that are not well, let's, let's actually back up a second. Tarmogoyf has kind of become the newfangled Urnum Jinn, which is to say, sure, it's got green mana and its casting cost, but usually you're seeing it in blue decks. Right. Usually you're seeing it in black decks. 
the decks that are more base green are often not running Charm Rogue Wife no, in running, Legacy. If you have a lot of green mana, you're probably better off running Scavenging Ooze. If it's a two drop that's really big, it also deals with graveyards. Doing something matters a lot. In a deck like Shardless Bug, what Charm Rogue Wife does is it provides a body that can attack and a body that can block, which is exactly what it needs to do. A lot of decks don't need those things, though. We go to turn two. Turn one, there was an Ancestral Visions from Jerry Thompson. Chris Van Meter lays a second land. He's got all three colors of his deck right there at access. All right, so Van Meter's on six cards, so he's already down two cards on Jerry. When that Ancestral Visions was also be down at least four cards, so he has to make these turns count. I think he probably wishes he had something like a Dark Confidant, something that committed to the board a little harder, but he's gonna go with a Hymn to Tura. Now, Chris Van Meter, clearly not in the Jerry Thompson camp of thinking that this is about um, pure card advantage. We'll have to see how this works out. Card draw and card discard are very different effects. Right, so that Timber Truck hits a, hits a Bayou and a Disfigure. Uh, one of the things that Himmler Turok is, can be really good at is land screwing people. It's one of the few discard spells that can just hit all your lands. And I think it may have done just that to Jerry Thompson. One, two, three, draws with a brainstorm. Two are gonna go back. It looks like he found one land there. Yeah, but he, here's the thing. He didn't find a shuffle effect to go with those lands. Uh, a very well-timed wasteland could be backbreaking for Jerry. Yeah, one of the things about him to Turok Old two players who know, or regular legacy players who know, him to Turox discard black black sorcery says discard two cards at random. It can hit all your lands. Random is a dangerous, scary thing. It's, it's probably why, to be honest, they don't they try not to print cards like that very often. Um, Jerry does have a, a virtual third land in the Deathrite Shaman, but um, the reason they don't want to do that is because of the potential. You know, if Jerry kept, could keep a three lander and get both his hand, lands ripped out, and it sometimes can stop a game from happening. Uh, Jerry's still in the game, but it's difficult right now. Thought sees from Chris Van Meter to follow up that him to Turok. Uh, excellent follow up. What do you have left, Jerry? We see Jace, which is a pretty good card. We see Tarmogoyf. We see Nihil Spellbomb. And remember, Chris Van Meter knows that there's a card on top of Jerry's deck knows that, that has Jerry hidden put it away. There. So the interesting thing is how much Moxie do you think Jerry had? Did Jerry was Jerry good enough to hide the fourth land for the Jace? Uh, Chris decides he doesn't want to take that risk. He's gonna take Jace the Mind Sculptor. So, but it's funny because by doing that, he is allowing Jerry to cast a Tarmogoyf. Tarmogoyf is, well, first Death Red Shaman attacks for one, Tarmogoyf follows it up. Shugs. Oh, pardon me, Shardless Agent, my bad. Into so Baleful that was not Strix. an attack, he's removing a, a land. The uh, Shardless Agent finds a Baleful Strix. All right, now Jerry, the, just what we said about the board state, Jerry's right now up three creatures to zero. He has extra cards coming in, that'll only help, that will help him because he's already ahead. Uh, Chris has to catch up. Four mana here. Remember, he knows there's a Tarmog Wife waiting in the wings in Jerry Thompson's hand. Right, well, and also Ancestral Vision ticking down. So he has options. He either can make the Stoneforge Mystic he drew, or he can do something like Snapcaster Him to Turok right now. Wow, Snapcaster Him is really interesting. Um, but Ancestral Visions will recover Jerry very quickly from that in two turns. We yeah. see that Snapcaster and the uh, Visions. Two cards gone. Two oh Tarmogoyf. my goodness, that That's, was a good him to try. It is pretty good for Jerry, or sorry, for Chris, that Jerry was not able to cast all those Tarmogoyfs. Um, Jerry was left with just Nile Spellbomb. I mean, that was eight power that just went away. Right. At least eight. Once, not, once Nile Spellbomb hits the graveyard, it's more. <laughs> we see the Nile Spellbomb join the table. A black mana is available, so Jerry, if you wanted to, could just dig a little bit deeper and find some stuff. Text for three, and there's a shardless trading with a Snapcaster Mage. Right. Chris trying to preserve his life total. He wants to have, he he's trying to set himself up, I think, for something like if he can top deck a Jace the Mind Sculptor here, that would be real. That will help him get back, get enough cards so that he can make a board presence. He does have Stoneforge Mystic in hand, and actually he has Batter Skull in Boom. hand, naturally drawn. He's gonna go ahead and just make that. There's a germ. Now our germ token there, zero, zero. Earlier today on our conversation online on hashtag SCG Envy, a lot of people said that if they could be a card token because the winner of the Invitational gets to be featured on the Star City Games art card token, a lot of people said they wanted to be a germ. Right. Now, so one thing that Chris doesn't know, but it's unfortunate for him, do you remember the last card that's in Jerry's hand right now? Something awesome. It's a Maelstrom Pulse. Ouch. Which is pretty, it's a pretty good card to have when your opponent taps out five for a batter skull. It's actually one of the only cards 
in Jerry's mane that could take care of this problem. Jerry gives uh, Chris a little look while he's talking to him, and just I've seen that look before. It's the look of somebody yeah, who feels pretty like good this. about where he's yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom. At that point, I would ask my uh, opponent. You know, I would say the germ or the batter skull. Uh, you know, um, I mean, the answer on, is the batter skull. Online, I've actually had a lot of batter skulls live because somebody <laughs> misclicked on the germ. Clicked on the germ. Okay, back to Chris Van Meter. Empty board, two cards in hand, facing down a Deathrite Shaman and a Baleful Strix. And in a few turns, if this game continues, Jerry will draw three more cards. Now, Jerry did say this game was about what was on the board, not what was in the hand. When you draw four, or sorry, draw three cards, you get the opportunity to drop more stuff onto the board. When you discard, you might draw a discard spell after the fact, when it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, one thing we've seen here is that it's all in all three of our games, all of which have been fairly competitive. Whichever player, once a player like got ahead by two cards on the board, it seems like they never relinquish that control. And you know, and it doesn't matter. You know, Jerry keeps on keeps control by oh. playing ancestral visions. Chris does it, you know, with equipment and dark confidants. And it seems like it doesn't really matter how they're doing it. What matters is that they are doing it. I think we're gonna see a land Jace. Well, with. With this many cards, it wouldn't be surprising to see that come from, from Jerry. Three land in play and a Deathrite Shaman in play. Yeah. Okay, I guess I must have missed seeing that card. It yeah. must not be a Jace. He's got to make sure that GT doesn't get counters on it, if at all possible. He does have cards like Abrupt Decay to try to help that out a bit, or even just Disfigure for Stoneforge Mystic. Let's see if he has any of those right now. Only one card in Chris Van Meter's hand right now. One, two mana. Equip. Attack. All right, let's see if it works. Uh, Jerry's gonna start by shuffling on, shuffling away on the top of his deck, and we'll see what he pull, what he tries to get here. Whether he has the answer in hand or whether he's digging for it. Passes his deck back. Two mana. Abrupt decay. Goodbye, Umazawa's Jite. All right, and now, so Jerry there with the answer. That was one of crit. So Chris, it seems like he's not able to actually get enough. He he's not able to establish enough cards to deal with what Jerry's doing. So he kind of has to try to do is find a trump card. Uh, I think GTA was the best shot he had at a trump card, but it didn't trump right now. Jerry did have the removal spell for it. End of the turn, Jerry does a little ding with the Deathrite Shaman. Take two, Chris goes down to eight. Yeah, and Jerry, he's just gonna chip away, I think at this point. He can do three a turn between Deathrite Shaman and, ba and Baleful Strix and with the extra cards he has and the removal he has, it's gonna be pretty hard for Chris Van Meter to deal with it. Niall Spellbomb removes Chris Van Meter's graveyard and draws a card. Jerry drops a Jace. It's possible he might have had that Jace in hand earlier, but he wanted instead, rather than to drop it, he instead wanted to just make sure to kill that uh, that G tank. Right, so the equipment are really the trump cards in Van Meter's deck, but we already have a, the, the batter skull was Maelstrom Pulse, the Uma Zawa's G tank was Abrupt Decayed, Chris is going to try to look for a way to still to still find something that pulls him back in. Uh, he does not look hopeful about it. I think I see a Vindicate. Right. That's good against the Jace. However, his life total rapidly diminishing. Only seven life remaining. Um, Deathrite Shaman in play. Yeah, and what's interesting is a lot. So what Chris will have to do to, to help his own life total is get his own Deathrite Shaman going to maybe to hope to gain some life back. Remember, he a lot of his cards that help close out the game are cards like Dark Confidant. Those cards aren't even very are not very helpful right now because of the low low life situation that he's in. One of the reasons the life is the one of the pillars of the game is just because of situations like this. All the cards in the world won't matter if you're dead. Right, so he has I think another Stoneforge Mystic. Um, he only plays two pieces of equipment between main and board, so they're just one twos at the moment. Chris Van Meter says, well, I can't block your Strix, and your Deathrite Shaman's just gonna dome me. I'll attack you for one. Jerry draws another Shardless Agent, uh, just gonna continue adding more to the board. Shardless Agent says, go oh, Charm. All right. And he's yeah. like, ah, I'm he not even gonna even cast, cast it. <laughs> I mean, that is something you can do with Cascade. You can just choose not to cast the spell, and it won't happen. Right. There are three different modes on that Golgari charm, none of which were particularly exciting. There was no enchantment, shrinking creatures was actively bad for Jerry, and regenerating his own creatures was useless. 
But either way, he has Van Meter down to six. Looks, looks, looks like it's gonna be four, then two off Death Rite Shaman. Um, yeah, it's three activations of Death Rite Shaman. So we'll see one on end step here. Jerry just needs two more. The whole Air Force here looks great, but will it be enough? Let's find out four cards, three from the Ancestral Vision, and then one. Jerry Specimen is targeting myself. Remember, Ancestral Visions does target. That is a sick, sick situation. And Chris Van Meter, I don't believe he has any immediate life gain outside of swords in his own creature. Uh, because of that, it's going to be pretty... Well, he, he need to draw a swords for Death Rite Shaman immediately. You might be saying to yourself, but Matthias, I think that Jite and Batterskull gain life. Well, those they cards are both life. in the yard or removed from game already. And Jerry actually presents another lethal attacker with Creeping Tar Pit. Chris will need an answer to that as well. He gives himself an insurance death right shaman and Chris Van Meter. That is he thought all seizes Jerry wrote. For, for the honorable path. I kind of wonder um, when it comes down to this, 